Are you going to address Dave Wiley's question, Josh? 
<laughs> Good evening. I'm Derek Broman, and I'm the Acting Game Program Manager for the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Thank you very much for tuning in on our third webinar regarding the latest draft chapters of the Oregon Mule Deer Management Plan update. These latest chapters cover several diseases that can affect mule deer populations, as well as discussing topics related to mule deer habitat, nutrition, climate change, disturbance, and land management. I just want to restate that we at ODFW are extremely passionate about mule deer in Oregon. Just like all of you listening, mule deer are incredibly important to us as native Oregon wildlife species, a harvestable resource, and a flagship species for improving habitat quality that benefits not only mule deer, but the hundreds of other native species that also depend on those habitats. That said, this effort to update the mule deer plan is something we are taking very seriously. This plan update is an all hands on deck approach for the agency. The content shared to date is the collaborative product of numerous wildlife biologists, wildlife researchers, and other subject matter experts with combined decades of experience and using innovative research that saw us collar thousands of mule deer to evaluate what's happening on the landscape. For tonight's topics, co-authors for the draft chapters include researchers who specialize in analyzing wildlife habitat selection, ungulate nutrition, competition, and wildlife diseases. For example, the disease and parasites chapter was co-authored by ODFW's state veterinarian, Dr. Colin Gillen, who has decades of experience and is considered a leader among wildlife veterinarians and fish and wildlife agencies. ODFW will continue to pull in internal and external experts to help in our goal of updating the mule deer plan so it best serves the entire public. With that, let's get started with tonight's webinar. As stated earlier, we'll be discussing two chapters, Parasites and Disease and Nutrition and Habitat. We will start off with staff presentations and then finish with a live Q&A session. If you're watching live, hopefully you saw the notification to submit questions or comments in advance to increase the likelihood of being included in the live Q&A session this evening. We will be receiving questions live, but please recognize that we may not get to all of the questions received and you're welcome to submit questions afterwards as well. All questions can be submitted using the link in the YouTube video description below, the QR code, or on the Mule Deer Plan webpage. Starting off tonight is a pre recorded presentation from Dr. Don Whitaker, who is the ODFW Ungulate Program Coordinator, followed by Dr. Darren Clark, head of ODFW's East Region Wildlife Research Lab. We've recorded these presentations in advance so that we can minimize any technical difficulties. But Don and Darren will be a part of the live Q&A and as always, are available for follow-up via email or a phone call. So Don, if you would, please proceed with your portion of the presentation. The Fish and Wildlife. I've spoke to many of you before. In my early years with ODFW, I also served as the wildlife health lead for the state until we acquired Dr. Colin Gillen as our state veterinarian. Thus, Dr. Gillen and I co-wrote this chapter on parasites and diseases for mule deer. I want to first start out with reiterating that the purpose of these webinars is to share information and get your feedback on this important mule deer plan revision. It's easier for us to address your concerns and your comments if you've submitted them already in advance of this meeting, but we'll also try to keep track of any comments we receive during this presentation. We would like you to use the form itself on our website, and I'll show you a, a URL or a QR link to get you into there pretty easy in, in the next presentation. Note that we will record uh, the Q&A session following this presentation as well for our ease to come back and, and uh, review those questions and the concerns that you might be submitting. For today's 
But for this evening's seminar, I'll go through a brief review of our revision process. Then I'll talk about the parasites and diseases of Oregon mule deer, and that'll be followed by Darren Clark discussing mule deer habitats, nutrition, climate change, issues like that. Our mule deer plan revision process began over a year ago. We started with some internal scoping early in 2022, and then followed that directly with um, attempts to get some public feedback from sport group leaders. We began releasing information in specific sections in January, and that continues and will continue through this fall. Um, these webinars, this is the third webinar, these will continue through the fall winter of 2023. Our objective is to compile a full draft in the late fall or early winter of this year with a tentative adoption in early 2024. So jumping right into parasites and diseases of mule deer, these things are a normal part of mule deer biology and ecology. Oftentimes, Diseases and parasites and mule deer co-evolve together, and as a result, most issues related to health for mule deer are generally not treated or rarely treated because we just can't put our hands on every individual within a population. So why should we worry about diseases and parasites and mule deer? Well, um, the agents or the bugs that cause disease could change. And, and sometimes that change is accelerated with the changes in the environment that mule deer live in. So we're trying to pay attention to all of those things that are going on. Um, we know that there's also new things coming in that can affect mule deer from a parasite and disease standpoint. So we want to pay attention to that. These combined can lead to impacts at the population level. So we want to keep track and know what's going on. And of course, parasites and diseases tend to be complicated when animals get concentrated. And as our environment or the environment for mule deer changes, that can lead to artificial animal concentrations. And in some cases, feeding situations can lead to concentrations that may increase the prevalence or the effect of any diseases for mule deer. So as I go through some of these important categories of diseases, I do want to put a specific note that some of the pictures that I'm going to present do graphically depict diseases in animals or symptoms of disease in those animals. So we'll jump right into one of the first important classes of diseases that affects mule deer, and that would be viruses. Mule deer are mammal, and we're a mammal, and just like all mammals, there's all kinds of viruses that occur in these species. An example would be the papillomavirus that's shown in the picture of this deer right here. Simplistically, those are just really big wars. It's not unusual to see these animals in the wild, and they tend to not be an issue for those individual animals. The exception would be is if they get a really excessive loading of those papillomas, and especially if they occur around the eyes, ears, nose, and mouth. That can provide to an lead to an impact in that particular individual. A common question on the papillomavirus is, are, are those animals edible if you harvest one? The answer is yes, you just have to be careful in your meat handling and preparation and just cut the affected area out and throw it away and treat the rest of the animal as, as just good red meat. The second very important virus that affects mule deer in Oregon is one of the hemorrhagic diseases. Um, there's basically three types of virus that cause hemorrhagic disease in deer. That would be the adenohemorrhagic um, disease virus, the epizootic hemorrhagic disease virus, and the blue tongue virus. Um, these are transmitted by a biting midge, and one of the symptoms when deer contract a hemorrhagic disease is they develop a fever. And because they're hot, they tend to be found a lot around water when they're suffering from hemorrhagic diseases. Oftentimes, that's where a lot of the mortalities are first discovered, is around water sources. Um, hemorrhagic diseases are, are accurately named. Hemorrhagic means ble bleeding. And if we look at one of the more obvious symptoms for an animal affected by hemorrhagic disease, 
is they tend to bleed a lot in their internal organs. The picture on the left is that of a normal digestive system for a deer. The pit, lots of lighter colors or green colors and you know the kidneys and livers are dark colored obviously. But when we look at the picture on, a, on the right, which is a, a di digestive tract of an animal affected by a hemorrhagic disease, there's a lot of bleeding and curves in those internal organs. And it's very obvious. They're very dark colored, they're blood filled. Uh, oftentimes the intestines and uh, colon appear almost black. Mule deer are susceptible to many other viruses. Most of them tend to not be an issue unless for some reason there's environmental, other environmental stressors or animal concentrations may um, exacerbate those and tend to magnify those effects. Many of those are, are similar to what would be found in cattle and sheep, uh, catarrhal fever, respiratory syncytial virus, PIV3, which is a flu virus, et cetera, ectema, skin, skin lesions. So it's not uncommon to see lots of different things in mule deer that are related to viruses. The next common class of issues that will lead to disease in mule deer is bacteria. And again, as mammals, we are all subject to all kinds of different bacteria that can cause illness to varying degrees. They're also susceptible to many of the exposure mechanisms that would include exposure to wounds, open wounds, or they could breathe it in as indicated by aerosol. Even eating some things or, or exposure through the mouth and nose. So there's all kinds of vectors or avenues for bacteria to get into these mule deer. One very common one, or relatively common one in mule deer that hunters often see is pinka. Um, Conjunctivitis, conjunctivirus is can, caused by a bacteria. It tends to not be lethal or impact these animals. The exception would be is if it's a very severe case, it can lead to blindness, which ultimately could lead to issues for that individual. Um, bacteria also tends to uh, cause abscesses. Oftentimes wounds can become infected and if they get a severe infection, that can lead to an abscess. And it's not uncommon to find animals out there on the landscape that might be suffering with an abscess. A few bacteria that we, we find irregularly, but they are concerning to us when we do find evidence of those are related to the tuberculosis stuff. There's two primary ones that we try to keep track of, and that would be tuberculosis or bovine tuberculosis, the mycobacterium bovis, that's the cattle version. And then we get, most of what I've seen historically is the paratuberculosis, which is Mycobacterium avium. These are typified if, if, uh, if you're hunting and you are successful and you start during your field dressing process and you see these little nodules on the inside of the chest cavity, um, please use that as a signal to start with a little bit more caution. Glove up if you have gloves available. Try not to puncture those nodules and, you know, collect the sample or allow us to collect the sample so we can verify that it is or is not uh, tuberculin related. Moving on to uh, the third main class, and those would be parasites. There's basically two kinds of parasites, ectoparasites, which are outside the body, and endoparasites, which are inside the body. Now, from an ectoparasite, mule deer have all kinds of ectoparasites that are really commonly seen. Uh, a real obvious one is ticks, as indicated by the picture on the left there. There's fleas, there's lots of native lice that mule deer have evolved with. As a general observation, most of these ectoparasites do not cause serious issues for mule deer. Um, they co-evolve together, so it, it, it'll it go through periods where the loadings might be fairly heavy, but it doesn't cause much of an impact. The concern for us and for mule deer would be for any parasites that are not native and they didn't have an evolutionary history together with mule deer. 
And we do have one of those that we're paying attention to a little bit, and that would be an exotic louse. It came down through Western Oregon and black-tailed deer, and we found a few limited individuals in Eastern Oregon that are mule deer that we try to pay attention to. So again, the concern is those that are novel or have no history, those tend to have a little bit more impact to individual animals. Internally, the in parasites in inside the body, no shortage of those that will affect mule deer. Uh, some very common ones just here to use as an example that tend, again, to not be an issue for individual animals. Um, for example, the picture on the right depicts the bot larva. Uh, essentially, bots are fly larva. They're very large, almost a maggot type thing. They exist in the, the throat, the larynx, the nasal passages in the mouth. Deer hunters commonly find these in animals when they ask. They tend to not affect the animal. They tend to be um, short-lived in some cases. And again, mule deer have been dealing with these evolutionarily for quite some time. On the left, uh, hunters frequently call us and say, I found all these little white spots in my meat. What's going on? Well, that's the sarcocystis. That's an internal pro protozoa that exists in the muscle tissue of deer and many, many other animals. Uh, common question is, can I eat this meat? Well, if all, like we all should do with all of our meat, we should prepare and cook it properly. If cooked to properly, there is no issues with sarcocystis in the meat. The middle picture depicts some uh, tapeworm larvae that are commonly found in the, the lower GI area when you're field dressing animals. These clear jelly filled sacs that are attached are the larvae for a variety of different types of tapeworm. As most of us know, all of these entrails are usually left on the landscape. We don't bring those home typically, but I do want to caution everybody that those that may be hunting with dogs or have dogs out on the landscape, caution should be warranted and you should not allow your dogs to consume these gut piles. Deer or the in the internal intestine area, those are an intermediate host in the life cycle of the tapeworm. And if your dog consumes it, they can get that tapeworm and it could have a little bit of an effect on your dog. The last real disease I want to talk about in deer uh, has not been found in Oregon yet, and that is chronic wasting disease. But it's garnering a lot of our attention right now. Chronic wasting disease is a transmissible fungiform encephalopathy. It affects the neurologic system in members of the deer family. Uh, once contracted, it will lead to some behavioral changes, some uh, lack of muscle control, which can cause excessive salivation, uh, progressive weight loss, and 100% eventual death once that animal contracts chronic wasting disease. Takes a few years for that death to occur, uh, but it is 100% fatal. It's um, transmitted through a variety of methods, nose-to-nose -nose contact between infected and uninfected in animals. It's passed from the mothers to the fawns in utero, and it's passed in body fluids or bloods that are um, extruded out onto the landscape, and it has a very long lifespan even on the landscape. So we're very concerned about some of these issues. Um, there is no known cure and there is no known treatment for CWD in the deer family. There has not been any successful eradication in any of the 20 plus states that now have chronic wasting disease on the landscape. But some recent work in a number of states is showing some success in managing the distribution and the prevalence or how frequently it occurs in the animals within a herd. It's getting a lot of our attention now here in Oregon because during the 2022 fall hunting seasons in Idaho, they did find chronic wasting disease and it's within 25 miles of our state border along the Snake River and it's been found in elk, mule deer, and whitetail. Uh, 
And we do know that elk, all three of those species do cross back and forth across the Snake River from Idaho to Oregon and from Oregon to Idaho and back and forth. So it's getting a little bit of our attention right now. Some of the issues and strategies that we've developed in this section for parasites and disease, obviously chronic wasting disease is getting close. It's a novel disease, it's 100% fatal. It can lead to population level impacts. So we're putting that as our number one issue from a parasite and disease standpoint. Um, number one strategy for monitoring for this is to increase our efforts. Uh, as many of you know, we now have mandatory hunter harvest sampling stations that we're setting up. We're asking everybody to help us participate in making sure we still don't have that. Uh, and it's just a simple few minutes to go through our check stations and let us sample the neurologic tissues so we can continue our testing efforts. We're also relying on um, meat processors and some taxidermists to help us with that sampling effort. Second strategy is to maintain and or strengthen our limits on private ownership of members of the deer family or captive servants. Thirdly, um, we've already imposed a number of issues limiting uh, potential sources of uh, contaminants into the state. One of those is making it illegal to bring in neurologic tissues and whole carcasses from states we know are already CWD positive. That would include Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, uh, many of the states that many of our hunters from Oregon will travel to as non-resident hunters. Um, if we do discover CWD somewhere in the state, state of Oregon, then we will implement our actions identified in the CWD management plan, which was recently updated in 2022. Finally, importantly, we would like to use hunters as much as possible for our monitoring and our management. And that it does include allowing us to sample any animals you may harvest. And two, if we start implementing management strategies that involve taking animals out of the population, we'll probably rely on the consistent help that our hunters provide for us. From a hemorrhagic disease standpoint, we consider uh, those diseases endemic within the state of Oregon. However, um, we do want to maintain or increase our monitoring of animals that might be exhibiting symptoms for a viral hemorrhagic disease. And as you can see in the picture, one of the common things that if you encounter a carcass out on the landscape, oftentimes they will have a, a pinkish, frothy, foamy mouth. And, and that can be there for a little while till the wind and the weather gets to it. So if you encounter those, we would really like you to let us know what's going on. Um, if we do find and encounter viral hemorrhagic diseases out there on the landscape, uh, we will try to come up within our logistic capabilities to evaluate the impacts to the local population where it's been found. Issue, a third issue to talk about is we know there's plenty of other diseases and parasites out there. One example in this picture is this is uh, deer pox virus in this deer. So when highly unusual animals are found out there on the landscape, a quick call to us and some, uh, if possible, we'll see what we can do about trying to see what exactly is going on with this individual. Um, within our logistic capabilities, any mule deer mortalities with some sign of disease, uh, we'd like to, to see what's going on and, and evaluate that animal. Finally, we know that concentrations can be a problem for animals. They tend to increase the amount of disease out there in the animals and in some cases will increase the level of impact on that population. So we are gonna to try to step back and look at all other rules regarding feeding and baiting of mule deer, and we'll see what potential options might be there to strengthen those protections for our native species out here on that landscape. With that, I would now like to turn the webinar over to Darren Clark for his discussion on habitat and nutrition related issues for mule deer 
in Oregon. climate change, disturbance, and land management on mule deer habitat and available nutrition. S start out with a discussion of habitat and broadly what habitat is. So as defined by the Wildlife Society in a publication by Krausman and Morrison in 2016, habitat is defined as the resources and conditions present in an area to produce occupancy, which may include survival and reproduction by a given organism. And ultimately what this means is the habitat conditions are collectively all of the things an animal needs to meet uh, the ability to survive and reproduce in the landscape. And these include things like the vegetation in the landscape, but also temperature tolerances that the species can live within, and a variety of other factors that collectively make up the habitat and ensure that the species can survive and reproduce. Specifically, when looking at mule deer, there are several components that go into mule deer habitat, and this is not an all-encompassing list. But there are things such as food, water, thermal cover, hiding cover, and so thermal cover so deer can either uh, obtain shade or stay out of the sun, or during the winter uh, seek cover to reduce the amount of heat that's transmitted in the atmosphere and save energetic costs. Hiding cover can be both hiding cover from humans or it may be from predators that may be looking for the deer um, within their habitat. There's also components of summer range and winter range for mule deer as well as the migratory, migratory connectors between both summer range and winter range. Other things such as spawning areas where these does select areas where they can successfully raise a fawn. Broadly, uh, throughout the western United States, mule deer habitat is broken into ecoregions. And what ecoregions are, are large geographic areas that have fairly similar conditions and create fairly similar habitats throughout those areas. This map on the left shows the seven mule deer ecoregions defined by the mule deer working group. And three ecoregions do occur within Oregon, but one of those is the coastal rainforest, which is where black-tailed deer live. And we won't be speaking about that today, but rather focusing on the two other ecoregions that are east of the crest of the Cascades, including the Intermountain West and Northern Forest. The picture on the right here does display a portion of the Northern Forest and the Blue Mountains. And the northern forest ecoregion is typically in Oregon, these forested areas on the east slope of the Cascades and the Blue Mountains, uh, where you have relatively productive forests and areas that produce fairly good mule deer forage. And often with these steep mountain terrains dissected by valley bottoms, the northern forest ecoregion is one of the more productive mule deer habitats in what, throughout their range. And this is because of this ability to grow conifer forests. When the canopy does open up, this creates a lot of forage resources available to mule deer, where they are then able to obtain adequate body fat to successfully survive and reproduce. So mule deer populations in the northern forest ecoregion do have the ability to increase at some of the highest rates observed throughout mule deer range. The other dominant ecoregion in the in Eastern Oregon is the Intermountain West ecoregion, and this is more typical of the sagebrush steppe ecosystems in South Central and Southeast Oregon. Uh, as I mentioned, these are sagebrush dominant systems. They tend to be arid to semi-arid landscapes, and they tend not to be quite as productive from a vegetation standpoint in providing high quality forage to mule deer, and drought is one of the biggest limiting factors or a factor that prevents mule deer populations from increasing in these areas. During severe drought years, forage conditions can be quite bad, and mule deer struggle to put on body fat to be able to successfully reproduce and survive through the winter. So broadly, those are the two geographic regions uh, that mule deer occupy in eastern Oregon. And from that, we're going to move into a little bit of research from Oregon where and what we've learned about habitat use of mule deer, uh, primarily in the northern forest system, but some of these lessons apply to both areas. So in these figures here on the vertical axis, we have relative probability of use ranged from zero to one with values at one indicating these are areas deer really like to use and values close to zero indicate areas that deer don't like to use as much. On the figure on the left, we're looking at tree canopy cover. We have this rounded relationship here with kind of a peak use by mule deer in the kind of the 35 to 45 percent canopy cover range. So deer are targeting these areas that have kind of that moderate canopy cover in these forested systems. And we also see in the figure in the right 
deer tend to be using areas closer to forest edges. And forest edges are the interface between forested areas and non-forested areas, and deer like to spend a lot of time here. So to kind of visualize a little bit further, um, this is just a picture of a forested area in the Blue Mountains in Oregon, uh, showing the after effects of a fuel treatment project that opened up the forest canopy. And those areas where you see the forest canopy is now opened up, those are kind of the preferred areas where mule deer like to forage. Also, they like to forage along the edges of these stands where you have dense conifers in these more open areas. The reason deer like to forage in these areas is you get increased light penetration to the forest floor. This allows increased growth of forbs, grasses, and shrubs, which are all key components of mule deer diet. And they tend to be of higher quality value when they get increased light, allowing a uh, higher quality species to grow in that understory, which deer can then utilize. But there's also a balance here where deer also need to have some of these patches of thicker trees to use for available thermal and hiding cover to meet all of their life history requirements and be able to effectively survive and reproduce. The other things we've seen on summer range, um, again, these are similar figures where we show the relative probability use with zero be indicating low use and one high use is that deer tend to use areas closer to streams. Whether those are intermittent or perennial streams, those that run year round or those that only have water in them part of the year. Deer tend to use these areas more frequently than others. We also see that deer tend to use flatter ground during the summer. These flatter areas likely have two benefits. Most of this data is coming from does. And so during the summer, they do have their fawns and it's very difficult for fawns to move around very steep terrain, particularly early on in life. And so there's probably some advantage to being on flatter terrain, allowing those fawns to be able to move. But there's also energetic costs associated with moving on steep terrain. So deer are likely focusing on some of these flat areas because it's easier to walk, just like for humans, where it's hard for us to hike up a hill and easier to walk on flat ground. Same would hold true for mule deer as well. And when we look at use of areas closer to streams, this could be driven by water. Uh, deer could be coming in here trying to get water resources, but deer get a lot of their water through their forage. There's lots of water available in their food, and so they get a lot of water that way. And really what's likely going on is this is driven by foraging. So deer are likely focusing on these areas closer to streams because one, you have more water present, which is allowing plants to stay green longer and have higher nutritional value to deer. And you've also got increased light penetration along these streams. There's a natural break in the forest canopy along the stream. So you do get that increased light penetration, allowing more forbs, grasses, and shrubs to grow, creating quality mule deer forage. Now, if we switch gears here a bit, and focus on mule deer habitat use on winter range. What we've seen is that one of the primary determinants of where deer spend time is snow depth. So again, another one of these figures here with intensity of use on the right, one being areas deer like very much, zero being areas they don't like using very much, two that deer really try to get to low or snow-free areas on the landscape. This is primarily driven by energetics. It's very costly from an energetic standpoint for deer to actively forage and move through deep snow. Um, just as most of you are aware, if you're out hiking through snow, it's much more difficult than hiking on bare ground. So this results likely in energetic cost savings during winter. Deer are likely going to lose body fat regardless of available forage. And so if they can conserve energy and save those fat reserves to really get through winter, uh, staying out of snow will be a profitable way that deer can do this. We also see on winter range that deer tend to use areas closer to forest or are actually in forested areas. And as they get further away from forest, they're less likely to use that. We also see the deer kind of using these moderate slopes and these tend to be on the south and west facing slopes, which tend to hold less snow. So the topography use here changes a bit from some where they start using steeper ground, but this is likely a benefit of having less snow accumulation in those areas, particularly on the south and west facing slopes. They get more sun exposure and have less snow on them. And again, just to visualize this, this is a figure of some winter range in Oregon, and you can see a lot of junipers here on that moderate slope in the background. That's where deer spend quite a bit of their time during winter. And being close to trees had likely has a couple other energetic benefits for mule deer. One of those being that deer can seek thermal cover there. They can lay directly under those junipers, retain some heat that way, and lose less energy through burning fat to stay warm. But also those trees intercept snowfall, so there's less deep snow on the ground in those areas, and deer can more efficiently move and not um, have to burn a lot of energy hiking through deep snow. The final thing we see on mule deer habitat use on winter range is deer have a fairly strong avoidance of roads open to motorized vehicles. 
And this is likely an effort to avoid being disturbed by humans and being pushed around in the landscape. And again, this is likely an energetic cost savings for mule deer. They're trying to conserve as much energy as possible. If they're constantly having to move away from vehicles, they're burning extra calories that they don't need to use. So if they could stay away from these roads, that will allow them to conserve more energy and uh, be able to better survive through the end of winter. So after providing a bit of background on mule deer habitat use in Oregon, I'm now going to change into a different subject talking about mule deer nutrition. So mule deer nutrition is important because it sets the foundation for a lot of the demographic consequences and population growth rates for mule deer. A good starting point here is the concept of carrying capacity. And these are pictures here of Aldo Leopold, who kind of pioneered the concept of carrying capacity in the early 1900s. And this is a relatively simple concept to grasp where you're looking at the available habitat and resources in the landscape, determine how many animals can be supported. So in areas where you have better habitat conditions and higher quality resources, you would expect to see more animals on the landscape. In areas with the very low quality nutritional resources or other habitat features that are just not quite meeting the needs of the animals in that area, and you're gonna see fewer animals. So this is an important concept that really links how important habitat is determining how many animals can be supported on the landscape. But this concept can be refined a bit further by looking at nutritional carrying capacity. And this basically just breaks this down, disregards some of the components of habitat and looks strictly at the nutritional resources available on the landscape. And why this is so important is for ungulate species and mule deer included is that nutritional resources ultimately determine the rate of population growth rates and how many animals will be in the landscape. Effectively, nutrition is the foundation for which populations are able to grow and survive, reproduce, and persist on the landscape. So nutrition includes a variety of things. This includes things like vitamins and minerals. Generally, this isn't quite the focus of nutritional carrying capacity, but these are critical things that mule deer need to be able to survive. Um, but in general, vitamin and mineral deficiencies are not really known to occur in Oregon, and if they are, they occur in very localized areas. One of the key things uh, related to nutritional carrying capacity is forage quantity and quality, or how nutritious the forage is and how much of it is there is on the landscape that these animals can consume. And these include important things such as the amount of protein available in the food, as well as the digestible energy, so or how much energy animals can, are able to extract from the plant resources that they are consuming. The key concept of nutritional carrying capacity, though, is it does vary seasonally and annually. And this can vary for a variety of reasons. One of the primary ones being weather. So if you have drought conditions compared to a wet year, you're going to have less quality forage available in the landscape and likely less biomass of forage available. So during those drought years, you're going to have a lower nutritional carrying capacity than you would during more wet years. Climate change is also a component in this where we continue to see increasing temperatures and less precipitation during summer, which is leading to more drought conditions. So we may be seeing a longer term shift with declining nutritional carrying capacity over time. Things like forest management also play a role in nutritional carrying capacity. So this figure here on the right from Key et al in 2003 shows how forage biomass changes in relation to how forests grow over time. So if you have a fire or a timber harvest activity that reduces all the overstory canopy trees, you start out in this grass forb sedge stage, um, and then you start to see increase in available forage biomass for deer about six to 10 years out. And then as you start to get more conifers growing in the understory and start to shade out some of the plants, you see a decline in available forage biomass. We're kind of bottoms out in these second growth forests that are really dense with dense canopies where not much light is hitting the forest floor, allowing for other shrubs, forbs, and grasses to grow, which are the key forage species for deer. And then you start to see an uptick again in some of the older growth forests. And this is due to natural gaps that occur in the canopy due to wind throw, um, disease in some of these older trees, or some of them just dying and falling over, uh, creating small gaps and allowing uh, increased biomass production on the forest floor. Wildfire is also another component that will affect nutritional carrying capacity by reducing over overstory canopy cover. And often fire allows uh, plants of higher nutritional quality to grow that wouldn't be present without that fire coming through. Other things that do reduce nutritional carrying capacity are things like invasive species. And what we're talking about here is non-native annual grasses for the most part. So things like cheatgrass and medusa head and ventonata are all different species that come in and are not really palatable by mule deer, but they do start to cause other 
forage species to be eliminated from those areas. And you kind of get end up with a sea of unpalatable forage and very little for deer to eat in those areas. Another factor that influences carrying capacity or the nutritional carrying capacity is competition with other ungulates. So how this works, uh, other species are out there consuming forage resources. So as their populations may increase, that may also reduce the availability of forage for mule deer. And why this is so important is that this nutritional carrying capacity directly affects mule deer fat cycles. So this figure on the right is just a hypothetical graph showing how the body fat levels in an individual deer change from spring to summer, fall, and then going into winter. Coming out of winter, deer in their lowest nutritional condition with the lowest fat reserves, but they quickly build those back up in spring and summer when vegetation becomes green again and is highly nutritious, and then starts to decline again in fall when plants have turned brown or senesc and are no, have lower nutritional quality. And so that nutritional carrying capacity kind of determines some of the peaks and valleys that occur in this fat cycle. So during good years, you're able to put on more body fat, which then allow them to reproduce at a higher level and also be able to survive severe winter conditions the following winter. And so all this plays out over time where you see these peaks and valleys that are not going to be consistent year to year and are driven by changes in that nutritional carrying capacity over time. So factors that influence these body fat levels include their summer forage. That's one of the primary factors that determines their ability to put on fat. Winter severity will have some determination how much fat they lose over winter. Climate and weather patterns both affect summer forage and winter severity. And also reproductive status influences body fat levels. So those does that are able to successfully raise a fawn are due to the energetic demands of lactation or producing milk for their fawns are going to be unable to put on sufficient fat reserves compared to their counterparts who are not raising fawns. So ultimately, these low and high points are determined by that nutritional carrying capacity and that ability for the landscape to produce adequate forage of sufficient quality for deer to survive and reproduce. Now, when we look at the fat cycle, the fat cycle is basically driven by habitat and ultimately the nutritional resources that are available. So this will determine how fat deer are coming into winter, and this has a set of cascading demographic consequences. So deer that are in worse shape or have lower fat reserves tend to have lower pregnancy rates, lower tweening rates. They will give birth to smaller fawns later into the fawning season, which will then ultimately influence the growth rate of these fawns, and that will ultimately influence the survival of those fawns throughout summer and into winter. So those bigger fawns are better able to survive than their smaller counterparts. And the size of those fawns directly dependent on the nutritional condition of their mother, mother or how much fat that doe has. And ultimately, the last thing to be affected is the survival of the doe herself. If she doesn't have adequate fat reserves, um, she may die to overwinter because they ran out of fat and don't have any more energy to be able to survive through those harsh conditions. So these cascading demographic consequences based on the nutritional condition of a female ultimately pl all play a role in population growth, population growth rates or the size of the mule deer population. So if you have a deer population that has a lot of healthy does with a lot of, bo lot of body fat, those herds are going to be able to increase faster than those that don't have adequate nutritional resources to put on fat reserves to be able to successfully survive and reproduce. Now, based on research in Oregon, we are seeing evidence for nutritional limitations. So this figure here, there's quite a bit going on, so I'll take a minute to explain it. But the vertical axis here is digestible energy measured in kilojoules of energy per gram of mule deer forage. So effectively, just the amount of energy that's available in forage the deer are consuming. This is broken down into five vegetation associations, ponderosa pine, grasslands, grand fir or subalpine fir, truly grand fir stands, and Douglas fir stands. And this vegetation sampling was conducted in the spring and summer of 2016 and 2017. Uh, you can see, see the bars on the left, every one of those are the spring conditions. And generally the spring conditions tend to be higher than the summer conditions within the same year. And that makes sense during the spring, that's when plants are of high nutritional quality. Um, as you get into summer season, they start to get structural compounds within them that make them harder for deer to digest and there's not as much energy. And then there's variation between the two years, and that's likely driven by the difference in weather patterns where we had more of a drought year in 2017 when collecting this data. But one of the key take homes from this is this orange bar here represents the energetic demands to support lactation 
or production of milk in does. And the key take home here is there wasn't a single condition here, whether in spring or summer of 2016 or 2017, where the available forage was of high enough quality to support the energetic demands of lactation. And effectively, this means these does were unable to provide milk for their fawns to allow them to grow quickly enough to be able to survive well. And so this is really an issue if you don't have high enough quality forage to support lactation, these does are really going to struggle to raise fawns as well as put on body fat for themselves. This next bar here at about eight and a half to nine kilojoules of energy per gram of forage, that's just the baseline energetic requirements of a doe. That's what she needs to meet her basic needs. And in most cases, we were above that. Um, so does, if they were not raising fawns at the time, would be able to put on body fat. But during the summer of 2017, there wasn't really a vegetation association where we were strongly meeting those demands. The mean values of the adjustable energy are right at that threshold. So during that summer of 2017, those does were probably going to struggle to put on body fat, let alone be able to raise a fawn. So this is some evidence of nutritional limitations. The available quality of forage on the landscape simply is, does not appear to be enough in some areas to support basal energetic needs, as well as not even coming close to be able to support the needs of lactation and be able to successfully raise a fawn. Additional evidence for nutritional limitations that we observe in Eastern Oregon is based on some new research we are conducting in the Murders Creek herd range. And so this figure on the left here is a map that shows the capture locations of does that were captured during December of 2022. And so the size of those circles basically indicate, indicate the depth of rump fat that they had during capture. So going into winter, how much fat they had on their rump fat rump. And that rump fat value is then converted to IFBF. And IFBF is ingestive free body fat. And basically all that is, is basically the percent of that animal that is fat. So similar to when we report body fat for humans, it's a similar value. It just represents the percentage of their body that is fat. And this is coming into winter. So they've just come out of uh, plant growing season, put on fat reserves to try and make it through winter. And what we see on average, the deer in this population had body fat level of about 10.1%. And based on research conducted in other areas, it's been shown that you typically need above 12.5% body fat entering winter to have a stable or increasing population. So this, these results from the one year of capture that we've done so far would indicate at least during this year, the deer struggle to put on adequate fat reserves in the summer to be able to survive and reproduce effectively which would indicate that this population is likely declining, at least in this year, based on the available forage conditions on the landscape. So this is another route of evidence that we do have nutritional limitations occurring in Oregon and that available forage resources aren't sufficient to support a healthy mule deer herd. And the last line of nutri nutritional limitations we've seen in Oregon based on some of our own work is we also captured six month old mule deer fawns in December of 2022. We did this at two areas. Uh, we did this in the Crescent herd range, which is the herd range that extends from a little bit south of Bend down to about Silver Lake, um, in kind of a crescent shape, hence the Crescent name for that herd range. And then we also caught deer out of the John Day area or the Murders Creek herd range. We see that deer out of the Crescent area, uh, those fawns were on average about 77 pounds where those out of the John Day or Murders Creek area were about 70 pounds. Based on some research conducted in other areas, uh, it is indicated that fawns that weigh less than 77 pounds entering winter have very low probability of survival because they're simply not large enough to survive, survive some of the severe winter conditions that are experienced. And so, again, this is evidence of nutritional limitation because the ability of these fawns to grow and come into winter at sufficient size is directly linked to the body fat levels of their mother. So the does that are in better shape, have access to higher quality resources, can produce sufficient milk to allow these fawns to grow. And then once they are weaned or no longer dependent on milk, they're also living in an area that allows their mother to put on fat reserves, but that will also allow them to grow more quickly. So again, these are sort of the reasons um, that there are some habitat issues going on in Oregon and that we are seeing effects of nutritional limitations that are ongoing in Oregon in multiple areas. After showing some of the evidence for potential nutritional limitations that are occurring in mule deer herds in Eastern Oregon, 
there are several reasons why this might be occurring. So some of the potential causes of reduced nutritional carrying capacity include changes in land management, altered disturbance regimes, climate change, competition with other ungulates, and human development. So I'll go through each one of these in a bit more detail here now. So if we look at land management, since the 1980s, we've seen great reductions in timber harvest in the forests of the ecosystems in eastern Oregon. Um, this includes both the Cascade Range and the Blue Mountains. At the same time, we've also seen increased fire suppression. Uh, so putting out fires and, not, and altering that natural disturbance regime, coupled with reduced timber harvest, has led to a lot of forest conditions in the landscape that look like this picture here. We've got this dense ingrowth of conifers that don't, doesn't allow light penetration of the forest floor and allow for the ability for high quality forage species to grow in that understory. So simply put, due to these changes in management practice in the land, we're seeing these dense conifer forests that just really don't allow for a large amount of mule deer forage to grow on the landscape. And we do know based on research that there are benefits of these forest management practices for mule deer. So this figure on the left shows the relative probability of selection. So this is a little bit different than the graphs earlier, where values greater than one here indicate deer are selecting these areas, or that they're using these areas in greater amounts than how they are represented on the landscape. In contrast, values at one show that animals are using those in roughly the same availability as what they find them or encounter them. And anything less than one indicates that animals are avoiding those or not using those areas as much would be expected by how much they occur on the landscape. So there's two lines here. One is the treatment line, and these are the areas that received uh, mechanical thinning to open up the forest under overstory and also re received prescribed burning. And the control stands are similar type stands that were had no treatments done to them and are just the kind of baseline conditions that were available in the landscape. What we see is that there's an increase in use of these treatment stands. Deer are starting to select for them uh, starting the first year after treatment. So the first two years in this graph, represented by negative two, are pre-treatment years where no treatments had occurred yet. Year zero was the year the first treatment occurred, and then the subsequent years, the number of years since that treatment occurred. So we're seeing an increase in selection. So deer are using these morias, these areas that were treated um, to open up the forest canopy more than they were using them at random. And these benefits lasted to about 16 years. And then we see a sharp decline in use of these areas where deer start to use them in a similar amount as the control stands where no treatments occurred. And going back to a previous slide where I did show kind of that successional pattern of how forage biomass changes over time, that 16 years aligns well. You're starting to get an increase in conifers in the understory again, which will start to shade out some of the available plant species. But the reason that deer are likely using these areas is really forage driven. So if we go to the figure on the right here, the vertical axis there is total biomass of forage available to mule deer. So greater values there mean there's more forage available. And then we have that broken down into three plant types, forbs, grasses, and shrubs. And we can then compare the control and treatment stands. And the real take home here is that there's a much greater amount of forage available in these treated stands than the untreated stands. So for shrubs, for example, we see almost three times greater biomass of shrubs, and shrubs are one of the key forage species of mule deer uh, or plant types for mule deer that they do consume, particularly in late summer. But we also see there's uh, significantly more uh, forbs and grasses in these stands as well. So collectively, these treatments that open up the forest canopy allow a lot more forage to grow for mule deer, which will benefit them by allowing them to put on fat reserves to successfully survive and reproduce. So what this looks like on the landscape, this is a before and after photo of this treatment that was shown in a previous slide. And really, you can see that did have a dramatic effect of opening up that forest canopy. You can now see the forest floor, so light's now going to penetrate down to there. And that will really allow grasses, forbs, and shrubs to increase the abundance and quality and create better foraging conditions for mule deer, which will allow them to put on fat reserves. The other things we've seen is altered disturbance regimes. So things like fire suppression that have been ongoing now for several decades has altered fire regimes to the extent that we now uh, don't see these mixed severity burns that occur anymore. We tend to have these very large mega fires. These mega fires tend to be complete stand replacement events where they take out all the green trees on the landscape and there's really no thermal or hiding cover left in these areas for deer. So these very large fires are also likely not beneficial to mule deer. While they may create uh, some forage on the landscape, 
there's simply not enough shade and other things in those areas for deer to be able to survive really well. So we've gone from what fires used to do is kind of this mosaic pattern here represented on the left, where you see patches of trees that do die during the fire. This does open up the forest canopy, allows some light to penetrate the forest floor, creating decent foraging conditions. But you also still have some green trees out there that deer can then move between these patches of uh, areas with reduced canopy cover and still have some shade for thermal and hiding cover adjacent to those. And this mosaic of conditions is really what mule deer need to benefit to meet all their life history requirements and be able to successfully survive and reproduce. Whereas these large mega fires represent on the right here where you have complete stand replacement, there's really no green vegetation left there. Um, so there's immediately after the fire, there's really nothing for deer to eat there. Granted, plants will respond pretty quick and start to grow back. But you also have no shading left there. There's no thermal cover. There's no hiding cover. And deer are going to struggle to persist in some of these landscapes due to these massive wildfires. Additionally, those large fires may also directly kill mule deer. The speed at which these move through there, deer may not be able to get out of the way and may actually be burned up or die in the fire due to the heat. So this altered disturbance regime is having an effect on available mule deer habitat and forage resources available in our forested systems. But we also see that there's changes occurring in the sagebrush systems as well. So fire suppression in these systems has led to a slightly different problem where you're now getting juniper encroachment into some of these sagebrush areas. Um, and where juniper starts to come in, particularly on summer range in these sagebrush systems, it has a couple of negative consequences. One, the juniper trees themselves take up a lot of water and moisture out of the ground, which limits the ability of other plants in that area to grow effectively and they be, may become water stressed and die off, which will reduce avail available mule deer forage on the landscape. Additionally, the areas directly under these junipers, not much else tends to grow. Junipers do put off toxins that prevent other plants from growing in the ground immediately under them. So as you get more and more juniper in the area, you're basically losing available forage resources because nothing can simply grow underneath those juniper trees. So this is another way that the nutritional carrying capacity is being reduced by simply taking what was good mule deer habitat and converting to things that aren't quite as good from a nutritional standpoint to provide forage resources. We also see due to fire suppression and the invasive non-annual, well, the invasive, <laughs> invasive grass species in the area, uh, we do see these large fires now coming through sagebrush systems. And when you get these big high severity fire events in these sagebrush systems, anymore what you tend to get is this conversion from a sagebrush dominated system into these basically seas of a monoculture of uniform, just cheat grass and medusa head and these non-native annual grasses that are not palatable to mule deer and do not make good mule deer forage. And when these invasive species come into these areas as well, they also fuel this fire cycle. It's a very dry flammable fuel that allows fires to spread more quickly at a higher intensity, which further leads to this cycle of converting sagebrush into these monocultures of non-native annual grasses that are not beneficial to mule deer. So collectively, due to change to land management practices and fire suppression, we are seeing quite a few changes in the nutritional landscape and availability of forage for mule deer compared to some of the historic practices that occurred in the late 1980s. And this transition has led to a reduction in the nutritional carrying capacity and available forage for mule deer on the landscape. We switch gears a bit here and talk about climate change. Uh, we have this work here is from the Starkey Experimental Forest, where we were looking at changes in um, how plants greened up, uh, flowered, and then turned brown or senesced in late summer between the 1990s and the late 2010s. And during this time, from the 1990s to the 2010s, we've seen a three and a half degree Fahrenheit increase in temperatures during summer, and also seen a 50% reduction in summer precipitation. So ultimately, we're getting more frequent drought conditions on the landscape in this forested environment. And collectively, this increase in temperature and reduction in precipitation has contributed to an approximate one, law, month, one month loss of the plant growing season. So in the 1990s, um, the green up period, which is when plants first start to green up following winter, they're highly nutritious and uh, provide really high quality forage resources for mule deer. That period lasted from about April to May in the 1990s. And then plants transition to their vegetative state. This is where they start to get more structural compounds. They flower. The nutritional quality drops a little bit, but still pretty good uh, for deer and elk. And this period in the 1990s lasted from about June to July 
And then eventually the vegetation transitioned to the senescent phase, and this is where the plants turn brown and have pretty low nutritional quality for ungulate species when foraging in those areas. And that period in the 1990s lasted from about August to September. If we look into the 2010s, we've seen a decrease in the length of that green up period and also a decrease in the length of that vegetative period, but an increase in that senescent period. So the period where plants are at their most high nutritional values really been constructed to about April and early May now. And that vegetative period runs from about May to June. And so we're still getting pretty good foraging just about June. But by July, things are pretty much browned up. The plants have senesced and they are low quality forage. And that has effectively contributed to a one month loss of the plant growing season. And if we're losing that amount of time, that restricts the amount of time that deer are able to forage on high quality resources and put on body fat that's going to allow them to be able to successfully survive and reproduce. So the way this works is basically climate change, shortening that growing period. So a lot of these peaks, so deer are not going to be able to put on as much body fat during the spring and summer. So you're going to see this lowering from that blue line down to that red line where you're going to start seeing deer coming into winter in lower nutritional status, which is then going to contribute to the cascading demographic consequences that we talked about earlier. You're going to see reduced pregnancy rates, twinning rates, fawns are going to be born later and smaller. They're not going to grow as well, which is going to reduce their survival. And if those aren't able to put on enough body fat themselves, their survival is going to be affected as well, which is going to contribute to declining population growth rates and the size of the population. So climate change through altering the forage dynamics by reducing that growing season of plants is then directly affecting body fat of these does, which then affects their ability to survive and reproduce. The other factor that may be contributing to declines in nutritional carrying capacity is competition with other ungulate species. And so competition can occur in two ways, the first of which is interference competition. And effectively, this is when one species prevents another from accessing resources on the landscape. And so these pictures here represent the species that do occur in Oregon, that we do know that there is interference competition. So with elk, we see that mule deer tend to avoid areas that elk use heavily. They shift to different areas, um, which is likely pushing them into areas with lower quality nutritional resources and the elk tend to be dominating those areas. So that's one route that elk are precluding mule deer from accessing these really high quality areas by using it themselves. We see similar things with cattle, but cattle can happen in two ways. Uh, cattle can directly displace mule deer and prevent them from accessing certain areas on the landscape, but cattle also have the same effect on elk where they will shift elk behavior, which will then cascade down to mule deer. And so cattle can directly displace mule deer and indirectly displace them by shifting where elk are using on the landscape, which may push deer into even lower quality habitats. And with feral horses, um, the there's also evidence for interference competition where feral horses will preclude mule deer from accessing certain resources. And most of the feral horses in Oregon occur in arid or semi-arid areas. And the real thing that they restrict mule deer access to is water. Feral horses tend to dominate water sources and prevent other animals from accessing them. And so if mule deer are unable to get access to water in these semi-arid arid environments, they're going to be able to, they're going to struggle to survive and reproduce in those systems. And so feral horses may also be contributing to reduce nutritional carrying capacity by limiting access to water. The other form of competition is exploitation competition. And in this scenario, this is basically where one species takes a resource from another. And how this occurs is by actively foraging themselves. Species like elk consume resources that mule deer could have eaten, but since the elk consumed it, it's no longer available. And so exploitation competitions most likely to occur between species that have similar diets or dietary overlap, or basically they eat similar things. So elk and mule deer have some overlap in their diets. And so by elk consuming forage resources on the landscape, they may be re removing the ability for mule deer to access those. And we have seen over time increasing elk populations. So this may be one mechanism by where the nutritional carrying capacity is being reduced by mule deer and leading to some of the nutritional effects we're seeing. White-tailed deer also have a substantial dietary overlap with mule deer, and we do see increasing white-tailed deer populations in many areas of eastern Oregon. And so this may be another mechanism by increasing deer populations may be taking away available forage resources for mule deer, um, 
And then when we look at some of the domestic species, there is evidence of dietary overlap between domestic sheep and the cattle. And so these species being on the landscape, particularly on public lands on summer range, they are consuming some of the forage resources that would be available to mule deer. And by taking some of those resources, that is likely reducing the nutritional carrying capacity available on the landscape. So another mechanism that may be contributing to declines in nutritional carrying capacity is human development. This one's fairly straightforward. By putting in subdivisions or energy development projects like solar farms, this is effectively directly removing habitat from the landscape. While you may see animals using these areas, the footprint created there is simply removing available vegetation and things that mule deer may want to eat. So if you convert a uh, good winter range into good winter range or summer range into a housing development, you're directly taking habitat off the landscape, which is going to negatively affect mule deer populations. So as a summary, um, we do see these five factors that are likely leading to reduce nutritional carrying capacity and the ability of mule deer to put on body fat to be able to su successfully survive and reproduce. These include changes in land management since the 1980s, altered disturbance regimes, ongoing climate change, competition with other ungulates, and human development. Collectively, these factors have altered mule deer habitat and nutritional resources available over time and has likely led to reductions in habitat and nutritional carrying capacity. So it's really important that we continue to protect critical habitats and conduct landscape scale habitat improvement projects that will be beneficial to mule deer. So we can really set a solid foundation from a nutritional standpoint for these populations to be able to put on sufficient fat reserves to be able to successfully survive and reproduce. Now that we've covered some of the potential reasons for declining nutritional carrying capacity on the landscape and the consequences for mule deer, we're gonna talk about some of the management strategies to implement to try and benefit mule deer habitat throughout Eastern Oregon. These management strategies are broken down into four topics, habitat connectivity, habitat improvement, climate change, and scenario planning. So the first strategy is habitat connectivity. So it's essential that we identify a key summer and winter range habitats in Oregon and the migration corridors between these. So we ensure that deer can access summer and winter range, they have connectivity to different areas and have the ability to disperse into new areas as habitat conditions improve. So the way to go about this is utilize the Oregon Co Connectivity and Mapping Project or OCAMP to prioritize key mule deer migration corridors and dispersal habitat so we can help provide protections on these areas to ensure that they are there to allow mule deer to effectively utilize the habitat that is available on the landscape. The second strategy is habitat improvement and improving habitat conditions is one of the key strategies to benefit mule deer populations in Oregon. Having high quality habitat sets a foundation for high quality forage resources that will allow mule deer to successfully survive and reproduce. And this is basically the foundation upon which the mule deer populations are built. So we really need to improve habitat conditions in Oregon to improve forage conditions. And the way to do this is primarily going to be through increased coordination efforts between Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and land managers. ODFW has limited ability to directly implement habitat improvement projects as many as will need to occur on public lands, which are managed by our federal partners. So increased our coordination levels and really identifying the benefits of these habitat improvement projects is going to be key and then trying to push those across the finish line to make sure these projects are implemented to benefit mule deer. It's also important that we conduct these habitat improvement projects at a sufficiently large scale. And this scale of interest is the herd range, so our actual defined boundaries of our mule deer populations to ensure we provide measurable benefits to mule deer. And these need to be large areas across the swath of the herd range to make sure we are improving habitat conditions throughout the area so multiple deer can benefit from these projects. And the scale of these does need to be quite large given the size of our herds, herd ranges and the area they do encompass. And this will take a lot of work on the ground to try and implement these, but this will require the close coordination between ODFW and our federal land management partners to improve habitat conditions for mule deer on the landscape. And some of these habitat improvement projects um, are going to range from enforced ecosystems, from timber harvest, forest thinning projects, and prescribed burns to try and create a mosaic of forest conditions. So we want to go out there and open up the forest canopy in some areas to improve foraging conditions, but we still need to leave some blocks of untreated forest so the deer can go in there for thermal or hiding cover and to kind of maximize the potential utility of that landscape to meet all the life history characteristics of mule deer so they can successfully survive and reproduce. 
So that's a primary thing we can do to improve habitat in our forested ecosystems. If we look at our sagebrush systems, we do need to work on efforts to remove encroaching junipers in these sagebrush systems. As mentioned before, these uh, junipers uh, take up water on the ground, preventing other plants from growing. And they also restrict plants from growing directly underneath them due to some of the toxins they release. So removing the junipers is going to improve foraging conditions for mule deer and ultimately improve the habitat and allow mule deer to the opportunity to survive and reproduce at a higher rate. And also in sagebrush systems, we need to go out there and treat these non-native annual grasses. Um, so going out there and uh, either through chemical application of herbicide on here to remove these and then trying to restore some of the shrub communities is going to be really beneficial. Going from these large monocultures across wide swaths of the landscape that are unpalatable species such as cheatgrass, medusa head, and ventinata, and going back to shrub communities is really going to improve forest conditions on the landscape in these areas and allow mule deer uh, high quality habitat conditions where they may be able to increase their survival and reproduction and ultimately the size of the mule deer herd. We also need to uh, address climate change. And while the agency itself has little ability to directly alter the trajectory of climate change, we do need to have a good understanding of how climate change is going to affect mule deer and their habitats. So when we are conducting habitat improvement actions, we need to do this with an adaptive management framework where we incorporate population and habitat monitoring. Are these things actually working? We uh, incorporate estimates of uncertainty. There's always some errors associated with our estimates of population, uh, the quality of the forage on the landscape. We need to incorporate that into the planning and then include these projected climate effects. We need to project out the future and understand what conditions might be present in the landscape and how we can plan for that accordingly. We also need to conduct additional research and monitoring to identify the effects of climate change on mule deer and their habitat until we truly understand how climate change is going to play a role in mule deer populations and their habitat. Um, we can't really provide effective habitat prescriptions. So continue researching this to understand what's going on and the effects of climate change are needed to best direct these habitat improvement projects. And we also need to report the threats of climate change on mule deer habitat. This way we can prioritize resources for habitat improvement. So if we understand what the threat's going to be, we can develop prescriptions that are then tailored to deal with the changes that are associated with climate change and make the most of these habitat improvement projects to be beneficial to mule deer. And finally, we need to have scenario planning. So we need to take all the projections of climate change, work those into possible management actions and alternative planning so we can be prepared for changing habitat conditions in the future due to climate change and other land management actions. If we have a good understanding of how these processes work, how climate change is going to affect us and how land management actions affect mule deer, we can identify different management scenarios based on changes that happen in the future to best tailor our habitat improvement projects to benefit mule deer. And we should also use these management scenarios to identify and forecast and predict changing habitat conditions for mule deer. So we can use climate change projections to understand how habitat conditions change might, might change moving forward and then identify potential management actions that could be beneficial to mule deer given the changes that are coming down the road. And with that, um, we do want to emphasize we really do want your input on this mule deer plan. So we are releasing chapters individually and we want to emphasize these are draft chapters. We want to incorporate public feedback and get your recommendations and comments so we can try and incorporate these as best we can into the management plan to provide the best benefits to mule deer and improve our mule deer populations in Oregon. Now, there's a couple different ways you can reach out to us. You can go to the website there. Um, the figure there on the right is a screenshot of the website. And on that website, you can access past webinars. Um, you can see all the draft chapters as they are released. And there's also a form on there where you can submit comments that will come directly to us and we will evaluate them when they come in. There's also an email address there for the mule deer plan. You can uh, subscribe to that. There will be updates sent out uh, when we're releasing draft chapters and hosting webinars. Other information related to the mule deer management plan will be sent via email. You can also just Google the Oregon mule deer management plan if you don't want to take the time to write down that link. One of the first results that should pop up is the link to the website where you can go on there sign up for email alerts and provide feedback directly to us. And you can also um, submit questions and comments to us. If you uh, scan this QR code with your smartphone, 
Uh, that'll take you to the link where you can do that and submit comments directly to us. And again, the website is listed there uh, along with the email address and that information. Um, we really want you guys to utilize that resource and reach out to us and give us your feedback on our plan revision and areas and concerns that you might have. And with that, we will take questions and comments. All right. Well, thank you, Don and Darren, for those presentations. Uh, we will now venture into our live Q&A session for the night. <clears throat> Realtor management plan questions of all types are welcome, and we are recording your questions. I'd like to thank you all that have submitted questions leading up to tonight's webinar. And that said, tonight's conversation will be focused on parasites and disease and nutrition and habitat. So getting started, I've got a question from the public to Don regarding CWD. And Don, the question is that um, if a hunter brings in a deer or elk to ODFW and the meat is not good because of some type of disease, do they lose their tag? And uh, Don, I'm gonna interrupt you here. I think your mute is still on. Technology, you gotta love it. Um, that's a very good question. I'm glad it was asked. Um, ODFW does have a few options in this kind of a situation. If an animal is brought to us, we inspect it, and we determine it to be not safe for human consumption, then our option is, is we can revalidate that tag and allow that hunter to finish out the season if it has not ended at that point. For this to occur, the entire carcass from antlers to tip of tail and all the meat has to be left with us. So the two key components in this question are one is we have to determine that it's not safe for humans. That means things like a few tapeworm parasites and, and uh, the ability to cut out um, papillomas and things like that. That means that we're not probably going to revalidate that tag. But if it is truly a severe loading of some internal parasite and there's some very clear issues with the meat, then we take the entire carcass, we make some notes on your tag, and the hunter is allowed to finish the season if it's open. Thanks, Don. And, and a kind of a follow-up question we also got from the public is that, you know, quite frankly, is CWD dangerous for people? Uh, we got a question that, you know, somebody plans on hunting in Idaho this year. What should they do or not do if they kill a deer and harvest a deer in that state? What's the the kind of cut and dry guidelines and recommendations for Oregon hunters that might be venturing elsewhere? Good question. Another good one. First and foremost is if you're going to go hunt in Idaho, especially if it's going to be near where they've identified CWD in those animals, I would prepare in advance and take field dressing gloves and a few things like that. And just honestly use caution when you're handling that animal in the field. Uh, sterilize all of your equipment that you use when you're done. Soak it in bleach, about 50-50 bleach water mixture for, you know, 15, 20 minutes to take care of all of that equipment. And finally, and most importantly, have that animal tested as per the Idaho processes that they're making available to all of the hunters in those areas. When you get your meat home, go ahead and get it all processed. Take care of the equipment you use to process it. But I would recommend not consuming that meat till you get your test results back from the state of Idaho. If it's negative, everything's good to go. If it's positive, then our real concern is that the meat is disposed of properly. And as I pointed out in my presentation, that agent out on the landscape persists for a very, very long time. So we want that meat disposed of properly. The easiest and best way to do that is incinerate it up above 800 degrees, turn it into ash, 
Um, and I'll follow that statement with the point that to this point, there is no evidence that CWD is an issue for humans if all you're consuming is the red meat and it's cooked properly. But caution is warranted, so use those cautions and that's why we'll allow that meat to not be consumed as long as it's disposed of properly. Thanks, Don. Uh, next question is for Darren uh, regarding habitat management. Um, so do you have recommendations or is there research that indicates the most effective size for habitat treatments, such as thinning or controlled burns to improve mule deer habitat? Yeah, thanks, Derek. That's another good question. Um, so at, currently in Oregon, we have not conducted any research to, research to identify any particular size of treatment that would be most beneficial to mule deer. And I'm not aware of anything in published literature that would suggest that as well at this time. But one of the key things is mule deer have home range sizes on average about 1,000 to 1,500 acres in Oregon, most other places in the West. They have very high site fidelity. They go back to those same spots year after year. So you got to think about the size of their home range and how these treatments should be distributed. You don't want to be having these treatments large enough that it's taking up entire home ranges of basically one vegetation condition. You want to, wouldn't want to go out there and do a very large clear cut where now all that deer can do is use that clear cut. Again, they need to have access to some of that thermal and hiding cover, as well as access to foraging areas that do have that open canopy. So in general, the thinking is this kind of patchy mosaic where you might be doing 10 to 100 acre treatments and you just kind of scattered across the entire landscape and creating this mosaic is really what's going to create the balance conditions that mule deer need to be able to survive. And this is really key on summer range where you're really looking at trying to boost those forage resources. So you, not too big, not too little, kind of that Goldilocks zone kind of there in the middle is really what you're looking for and creating that mosaic of conditions. It's going to take work over time as well. Uh, you can't just go in and then leave it again for another 30, 40 years. You got to keep going in there and treating some of the spots that weren't previously treated or retreating things again um, to make sure you do have that mixed conditions on the landscape. And I would say it's also got to be at that really large scale. You go in there and treat a little posted stamp within a mule deer herd range. You're not really going to expect a benefit to that population. You're going to benefit the few area that live there. So you need to be doing this across basically the whole herd range to really get a measurable benefit to the population. Thanks, so it, it sounds like there's some pretty clear recommendations and guidelines for how to go about improving mule deer habitat. But at least in Oregon, so much of the mule deer habitat is managed by either federal agencies, federal government, or private landowners. But ODFW doesn't have a lot of authority to take action or improve and enhance habitat on those lands. So, you know, we're talking about the mule deer plan and mule deer plan dictates the agency's action, ODFW's actions. What can ODF do to improve habitat for mule deer? So I think largely this relies on our partnerships with the Forest Service. Um, we have the uh, drawn a total blank here right now on the, our agreement with the Forest Service. Uh, good neighbor authority. <laughs> That's what I was looking for. Um, so we can engage in projects through that. We can also provide lots of feedback on forest plan revisions. You know, most of the forests in the Blue Mountains right now, we're likely gonna be engaged on another attempt to revise the forest management plans. And so that's where we can really provide input on the type of treatments and habitat conditions that would be really beneficial to mule deer. But ultimately this does rely on our partners, whether they're federal land managers, industrial timber forest, or even small landowners trying to implement some of these projects to benefit mule deer. It's gonna take a collective effort. And it's not just us engaging with the Forest Service. I think the public needs to reach out as well and really try and highlight to the Forest Service and other, the BLM that, you know, these land management actions are really important for mule deer and they should incorporate the public feedback as well to try and direct some of these conditions on the landscape to actually benefit mule deer. And so it is gonna be a collective effort. And yes, on our own, we aren't gonna go out there and be directly treating habitat for the most part on federal lands, but they do need our input and our guidance on the best approach to improve habitat conditions for mule deer and elk for that matter as well. So that's that's fair. Um, and I recommend or I recognize that like that's at times probably a complicated process that could take some time. But you know, what about private lands? If if we've got landowners coming to us or people hearing this conversation that want to do what they can. 
Uh, is there some clear direction or, you know, I, each situation is different, right? So um, some folks might not even live in Yielder country and this really doesn't necessarily apply all that well, but is there some simple guidance or uh, advice that we, we can convey to the public that want to improve their private lands? Yeah, I, I think there's some examples, you know, on the forested systems, we see deer like those areas about that 30 to 50 percent canopy cover. If you've got higher levels than that, you know, maybe look at some forest management practices that are going to open up that forest canopy. That's going to be, benefit mule deer. If you own, own more of the sagebrush type land, um, if you got juniper encroachments, try and remove some of that. Um, if you've got, you know, lots of non-native annual grasses, try and go out there and treat some of that. And there are programs available that the public could seek out state and federal funding to implement some of these projects on their own private property. And so that might be a good avenue to improve habitat on that localized scale within private land ownership as well. Good, thanks for the advice, Darren. Um, so maybe going back to you, Don. So um, it doesn't sound like, at least as, as far as current science goes, we're not really capable of curing or entirely eradicating CWD. Um, so how do we go about managing it and what is the overlap with the use of hunters as that management tool to address these CWD concerns? People are thinking these up. Um, it's a great question. The current science and evidence, a lot of it coming out from states like Colorado and Wyoming where the disease was actually described, is starting to point to uh, aggressive harvest or thinning of those populations that have high rates of CWD in it. Uh, the success is, is when harvest is aggressive in those localized population, it tends to do two things. One is it reduces the prevalence or what proportion of the animals in that population actually have the disease, and it tends to slow the spread of that disease within that herd and to adjacent herds. Um, since it's basically focused on harvest, um, we want to try to allow our hunters to help us with the management of these animals. And the real punchline to the whole thing is the component of the population that we will need to target is actually the buck component of the population because they're the ones that do most of the moving. Um, as Darren pointed out, these animals are pretty um, religious in the areas they like to use and the real movement occurs during two periods, one when the animals migrate summer to winter and back and forth, but also during the ruts when the bucks are moving around and they're actually interacting very closely with all of the does in the population. So if we target that part of the population, we can have some impacts. So it's important that we allow that opportunity for our hunting public to help us and take advantage of that action that provides uh, potential meat for those individuals and potential trophies for all of the various qualities of that trophy that they might pursue. And we have options. We will have options available for those hunters if indeed they help us and they find a positive animals. We'll, we have options to deal with that as well. Thanks, Don. And I know that's a complicated uh, topic, and I know a lot of hunters are very passionate about this topic and want to do what they can to help out with this. And certainly, you know, ODFW only has a certain level of staffing um, to help with sampling, but that's the great thing about our hunters and our, our regular users is that we've got the masses to help us in information collection, sample collection, et cetera. Um, so we're reaching about an hour and a half into our webinar for the night. And so I don't wanna have folks have to stick around too long to, to catch the end. So um, before I wrap things up, I wanted to give the two of you presenters maybe one last chance to to reconvene and reconvey anything that you have as take home messages or lessons learned or maybe asks uh, of our audience as we're, you know, this being our third webinar, our third release of, of content with more to come. Um, so Darren, is there anything that you wanna share or remind folks of, of your presentation of kind of like the, the main take homes or if somebody says, hey, I listened to this webinar tonight, 
and they wanted to share what they heard with their friends and and you know colleagues or what have you. What is it that you want them to be sharing to the, those smaller audiences around the water cooler? Yeah, thanks, Derek. Um, I think one of the key things is just I hope we really convey the importance of habitat and how that really sets the foundation to have productive mule deer populations and allow them to be able to increase. That really is the foundation on which our all of our wildlife populations are based, the habitat which they live in. And I think people might not realize that the changes in habitat have been small over time. Um, you still look up on the hillside, it might be forested, but it has changed a lot. There's a lot more trees, there are denser conifers up there, and there is less food out there for mule deer for a variety of reasons. And these changes have been small over time, but they are adding up. And it may be difficult to realize that and see that directly when you just say, look out the window, but things have changed and we really do need to key in on habitat and make sure that's a priority for mule deer and our other wildlife species throughout the state to make sure we have sustainable populations moving forward. Thanks, Darren. How about you, Don? Yeah, I, I want to reiterate that, you know, we here at Department of Fish and Wildlife are very much aware of the diseases that we have in mule deer and all of our other wildlife. We're watching for them. We're constantly looking for ways to manage those that we can manage and um, moderate those that we can't. And I also want to point out and thank our hunters because realistically, uh, around the campfire when fall comes around and the hunting season starts, you are our source of information because we can't look at every single animal out there on the landscape. But when our hunters are out there, the men and women out there, they're putting their hands on these animals and they're seeing things. And uh, when you contact us and when you stop at our sampling stations that we set up or if you're contacted in the field by our field staff, it's very important and very helpful if you allow us to look and allow us to sample. We do follow up with the results of all of those samples from our hunting public for our hunting public. So all of that help and that assistance as we start into the seasons this fall is very important, especially as we see on the horizon some pretty serious diseases that just are marching closer to us slowly but surely. Thanks, Don, and thanks, Darren. Um, and thanks, everybody, for watching tonight. Uh, we genuinely value your participation in this effort to update the Oregon Mule Deer Management Plan, and we look forward to additional engagement. Stay tuned for additional chapters set to be released in the coming weeks that will cover harvest management and predation and a corresponding webinar on the topics likely to occur sometime in September. Following those topics, we will then release sections on mule deer monitoring and anthropogenic impacts, as well as a herd range specific section where we will show population performance metrics and some herd range specific strategies for addressing issues specific to those areas. Finally, as stated earlier, questions and comments are welcome at any point throughout this lengthy process and can be submitted via the link in the YouTube description below. Thank everyone and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Good night.